Hey guys, and welcome back to another video. For you guys, it hasn't been very long since I posted. I'm trying to do more like three-ish videos a week. I don't know if I'll be able to keep that up, but I have been doing it like that. Um, but for me, I haven't recorded for three weeks because I just made so many that one weekend. So, um... Yeah, so in today's video, I'm going to be doing a book review. I've been reading this book over the course of like two or three months. Normally, books don't take me very long to read, um, and this book itself isn't very hard to read, but um, just the way that <clears throat> the way that it's written uh, makes it very easy for me to fall asleep while I'm reading it, so I kept falling asleep, and that's why it took me a long time to read it. Um, it's not boring, I just kept falling asleep. And so this book is called People on Our Side by Edgar Snow, published by Random House. And, uh, the number one thing that makes this book interesting is when it was published. This book was published in 1944, so it's written about World War II, and the person who wrote it was there in World War II. And so he is a newspaper journalist slash magazine journalist. And then this book is his writings about World War II in the different countries that he's been to. So first, to you, I'm going to read to you what is on the uh, outside and inside cover. Because the cover of it, the cover uh, is falling off. The paper cover. The book cover itself is intact, but the paper cover is really dying. It was falling apart as I was trying to read this book. And so when I'm done reading to you what's on it, I'm going to have to throw it away, which probably if this would be an antique book would make the value of it much lower. But since I'm not planning to sell it, I'm reading it or I read it. Uh, I'm not worried about that. So the front of the, the book cover says people on our side and it has illustrations of what I believe are to be uh, a scene from China, a scene from India, and a scene from Russia. And then underneath it says Edgar Snow and then a short description which is the engrossing story of the forces that are shaping the future destinies of Russia, China, and India by the author of Red Star over China. Then on the back it says People on our side will tell you about India, the truth about the failure of the Crips mission to India, what the dissenting factions in India are really fighting for, what the people of India want, and their chances of getting it. About Russia, the real reasons for the unbreakable spirit of the Russian people, that the Russian system of government is not turning capitalistic, and why, what our basis for friendship with the Soviets in the post-war world. And then about China, how Chiang Kai-shek is increasing his power, what the Chinese communists are fighting for, and who runs the Kuomintang. Then um, on the inside cover, it has a summary of the book and the front inside cover and the back of the book, it has some information about the author. So let me just read that to you. The author of Red Star Over China and Battle for Asia has recently returned from a world assignment during which he visited 17 countries, spending seven months in Russia and six months in China and India. His brilliant new book is concerned chiefly with those three great countries, their political outlook, their fight against the common enemy, and their social and economic problems. Snow's chapters on India provide one of the clearest and most comprehensible analysis of the apparently irreconcilable elements in Indian affairs that has ever been written. Those on Russia will be required reading, whether you are or you are not convinced that post-war collaboration with Russia is a requisite for world peace. His report on China today, the latest to come out of that bewildering country, is written with a background of years of knowledge unparalleled among Western writers. Edgar Snow is one of the outstanding correspondents of our time. His sense of historical perspective, his keen observer's eye, and his incomparably forceful writing have never been more evident than in People on Our Side. The back cover. Edgar Snow was born in Kansas City, Missouri in 1905 and educated at Missouri University and Columbia University in New York. 
Shortly after his graduation from college, he went to China, where he worked at various times as correspondent for the China Weekly Review, the New York Sun, Chicago Tribune, and the London Daily Herald, and wrote articles for the Saturday Evening Post. He studied the Chinese language, dug into Chinese history, and lived and taught as one of the Chinese, at one of the Chinese universities. He was the first foreigner to visit the Chinese Soviets in northwest China, and out of that experience came Red Star Over China, which has been translated into six Asiatic and several European languages. Battle for Asia, Snow's last book, was written while he was visiting the major battlefronts in the Far East and was published in 1941 when he returned to America. In April 1942, the Saturday Evening Post sent him abroad as staff correspondent. He went by clipper to Africa, thence by air to Cairo and on to India. He covered India, Russia, China, Burma, and Britain, and traveled 60,000 miles. His new book, People on Our Side, was written after the conclusion of this trip. So that is everything that it says on the book cover. And uh, so I thought that overall this book was very good. It was very interesting. It is really cool to hear about someone who was actually there at the time because he is visiting all of these countries while World War II is still going on. He went to Russia and visited the site of the Stalingrad battle just a few days after it was finished. So it's really, really cool because a lot of history books feel so like they're telling a story kind of abstractly and you're just like, oh yeah, sure, that happened. But it's really cool to read it from the perspective of someone who was there. He does a lot of personal interviews with different people around the different countries, but some of them you can either tell because he tells you, or you might guess that uh, the people who are governing that country have specifically shunted him in the direction of the people they want him to talk to. Um, especially in the section on Russia, that was like, one of the first times I'd ever heard a person have positive things to say about socialism. Not that uh, it is inherently bad or anything, like I'm not saying anything about my political views, but just in the area where I live, my family, and the people that I'm surrounded by, not many people are advocating socialism the way that it was used in Russia then. But this journalist, uh, is re noticing that at the time it seems like it's working out really well for some people, the people that he's seeing, and that productivity in the country has gone up since the Tsarist regimes, when when it was more of a monarchy. Um, and so that was just really cool to me to hear a very different perspective about it. He did say that if he thought that if the people who were living under the socialist regime were exposed to what true capitalism is, they wouldn't be satisfied. But because what they were used to was so much stricter than socialism, they were really liking it. Now, of course, this is the journalist's interpretation of how these other people are feeling based on what he's heard from the few people that he interviewed and the people that he saw. So obviously it doesn't apply to everyone at that time. But it is just super interesting because I'd never heard um, that perspective of it before. Um, also, uh, it talked about the way that India was divided up at the time. I took a world history class in um, grade 10, and I learned a lot about different countries, but I didn't learn a lot about each of those countries' governments. And so it was really interesting to hear about how India was divided up at the time of this book being written. What he describes it as is there were lots of little kingdoms, and some kingdoms were um, organized by, it was, it was kind of like a honeycomb looking like thing, if you think about it, except not at all even. But imagine a honeycomb thing, and the large honeycomb squares are where the British government is fully in charge. There might be like sort of a puppet leader in those areas, but the British government is fully in charge and the people there are fully under British government. And then all the little areas around the big, the big honeycomb squares, like the part that would be like the wax that you would get out of the honeycomb, that part is owned by different princes of the land 
And according to this journalist's writing at the time, the princes had a lot of the country's money and a lot of the people who were just general people did not. And also the princes didn't, many of them did not give their money to help raise the education level of the people who lived on their property or to like help them get more food. They spent it a lot on themselves and seemed like they didn't really think that reading was that important. Um, not everyone did that, but just many of the people that this journalist was exposed to did. And that was really interesting to me. Uh, I recently had a class with some students who grew up in India at my college, and uh, it would be really interesting for me to talk to them if I was able to see them again and ask what India is like now, because obviously now it is 60, 70 years in the future, because this was the 1940s and it's <laughs> 2020, so yeah, 60 years, no, 80, 80 years in the future. So it would definitely be different, but it would be interesting to see how that changed over time. Then there is a concept that comes up a lot closer to the end of the book, and it's this phrase that the author is using. He, he keeps using the phrase self-determination a lot. And I think what he's kind of means when he says that is the desire for independence and the like willpower and perseverance and like spirit of the nation and the individuals within the nation to um, break away from their overlords. So in India that would be the people trying to get away from the princes and or the British government that's keeping them from doing what they want. Russia that would be trying to um, kick the Germans that were invading out. And China that would be the different parts of China that were warring. I don't really know a lot about China currently. I met several Chinese exchange students also. We hosted some of them for a few days, but we never really got into that kind of thing because politics is kind of an uncomfortable subject to talk about with anyone, especially someone who is um, not the same first language as you. We mostly were explaining to them about the peacocks that live in our backyard and that sort of thing. <laughs> um, Anyhow, but the phrase self-determination, I thought it was really interesting that this person used it because uh, in my world religion class, the phrase self-determination was really important in the unit we were learning about Muslim cool, which was the combination of Islam and hip hop and, and specifically uh, African-American Islam or black Islam, not necessarily American, but that's sort of the context, and in that, uh, in that culture, knowledge of self-determination is a really, really important concept, and so it was really interesting to me to see the, the phrasing used for similar, similar meaning in such different time periods, but by people who were very much activists and trying to be leaders in their culture and community. If you were to read this book, which I do recommend, uh, I would say don't be reading it just to learn about China. Because from what I read, the majority of it is about Russia. And it's about, like, if I'm going to go and see if I can find the table of contents. Okay, so we've got... There's, there's three books, and there's India, the, the, like, there's three, like, you know how it says book one, book two, book three, but they're all in the same? Yeah, so there's three books. The first one is called Brown Bondage, and it's about India, and it goes from page three to page, uh, 66. Um, so that's 63 pages. Then there's book two, which is called Days of Victory, and it's about Russia. It goes from page 67 to page 244, which is about 180, 180 pages. Uh, not the best at math, but it's 
it's a lot. And then the book on China, Return to the East, is uh, from page 259 to page 314-ish. Uh, the page numbers I'm saying second are the first page number of the last chapter, so it's a little bit longer. But from what I read, there are three sections in the Return to the East uh, China it section, and the first section was not that much about China. So really, it's only page 277 to 314. Now, this makes sense because the author had previously written Red Star Over China, which is a book that's all about China. So he didn't focus on China. He mostly focused on Russia and then talked about India a little bit. It was also interesting to me to see about how this journalist was able to talk to all of these people that are now famous in history. They're not people that I know about, but they're people that the people in the country that he is writing about would know about. Uh, I think he wrote about going to see Gandhi, um, or at least, yeah, he, he interviewed Mahatma Gandhi, I believe, in the, in the India chapter, and like, wow, somebody that is alive, well, he's not alive, but like, you know, hearing it from someone who was there's perspective, and uh, he was also able to talk to some military generals in different, the Russian army and uh, other armies too. And he went on like these harrowing plane journeys over different war areas. And like I said, he was in the, he went to the battlefield of the Stalingrad battle a few days after it happened. So there were still people like fighting several, like, he wasn't super close to the battle, but he was pretty close. So it's just, like, really cool that people could even do that. For some reason, I always thought that, like, you couldn't, you weren't allowed to go places during wartime. But I guess that's just for civilians, because you're a journalist, your job is to go places during wartime and learn stuff. Which makes me really interested in maybe doing that. I don't know that I would want to be a journalist, because I'm very not good at exploring not good at not expressing my opinion, as in I would par it would be hard for me to write unbiased stories because I can write something about what happened, but it would somehow always end up with my opinion on it ending up in there. And uh, from what I know about journalists, they're really supposed to be unbiased. Even if they're not, that's what they're supposed to be. Um... I do recommend that if you have access to this book, that you read it. Also, in my copy of it, the front cover and the back cover have the same map. And the map shows the 1944 version of sort of uh, the East. I would say it's it shows you from... Arabia and the Caribbean, the Arabia and the Arabian Sea and the Black Sea on the left over to the Sea of Okhotsk, the Sea of Japan, the Yellow Sea and the Pacific Ocean on the left. And sort of in the center of the map at the top, we have the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. On the bottom, we have India and Burma, which are different places on this map. Like, Relating to where Burma is now, I don't even know what that is. It's really confusing. And then kind of uh, next to and slightly above India is China. And then between China and the, so the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics is Thinking and Mongolia. And then it's also got Manchuria, Tibet, Thailand, French Indochina. What is, what is French Indochina? I'm very confused. Afghanistan, Iran. Also, he, he writes about um, some world leaders having uh, meetings in Tehran, which is a place in Iran at the time. And I believe it still is, uh, but I could be wrong about that. And for some reason, 
when I learned that, I guess I didn't, I, when I learned about that, I didn't realize that's where it was. So that was just a new thing for me. Didn't realize that it was in Tehran or Tehran. I'm really sorry if I'm pronouncing any of these things wrong. I am not, I'm a, I'm a native United States speaker. So I, I don't, yes. All right. Yeah, so The People on Our Side book by Edgar Snow. I, I would definitely recommend that you guys give that a read if, if you have access to it. I don't know if it's even something you'd be able to find in libraries anymore. I'm not really sure how, how old of books they even keep there. Uh, if you found this interesting, uh, please let me know. If you have any books or movies or... TV shows that you'd like me to watch and review. I'd totally love to do that for you. Uh, I recently, as in like within the last month, finished watching the TV series Voltron. And I'm almost done watching the TV series Avatar, The Last Airbender, which I know is super popular. <coughs> Both of those shows I would really like to do some art from, too. So, uh, please let me know what characters, scenes, uh, side characters, animals, etc. that you would be interested in seeing me do art about. And if you enjoyed this, then please give it a like, or subscribe, or share it with your friends. And I hope you guys are all having a great day, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!